Okay, so you might be aware that a few weeks ago I asked you to like describe my relationship to Darkest Dungeon mm -hmm. for a very particular reason. Yep. So what I did after that is I got on a phone call with Wayne June, the voice actor from Darkest Dungeon, and I asked him all about his process and how he does what he does. Hey, hello. Can you hey, hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. <laughs> Excellent. That was really weird. Yeah, every, it's it's me. Uh, Skype is allergic <laughs> to me. Or yeah. I don't use it that much, but whenever I get on, something happens. Something Either goes I get wrong. On and it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, that's, you know, it's welcome to my world. So yeah. So he's the narrator. He's the he's the voice of your dead grandfather, uncle? Is he dead or is he... He's definitely dead. Yeah, okay, um, so he's super dead. He's super dead, and he's, like, calling to you from the grave. He, like, sends That's you right. a letter and then kills himself at the opening of oh, Dark Sunday. That is right. Yeah. Ruin has come to our family. You remember our venerable house? Opulent and imperial, gazing proudly from its stoic perch above the moor. I lived all my years in that ancient rumor shadowed manner patent by decadence and luxury and yet i began to tire of conventional extravagance and he Super sort of dead. narrates he narrates over the top of most of the game and he kind of narrates the fights he's in all the cutscenes. yeah and i guess like essentially the the estate that you play the game in is sort of it's he's it's... It's like his estate and you kind of uh, it's your kind it's of your families and he was like looking after it but he found he he went crazy found like the darkest dungeon and then has called on you to uh complete what he couldn't and then he kills himself in the end i alone fled laughing and wailing through those black and dark caves of antiquity until consciousness failed me you remember our venerable house opulent and imperial it is a festering abomination i beg you return home claim your birthright and deliver our family from the ravenous clutching shadows and then i guess like for he's you, you're sort of also picking you're kind of cleaning up his mess i suppose because pretty much of, it's entirely he dug his too fault. deep yeah so um, he's yeah. sort of the he's like he's kind of he ends up being a villain i don't want to spoil the game but he's sort of a bad guy so i sat down with wayne june on a skype call um the morning before i moved house which was stressful <laughs> um, so i wanted to run you through that and um see what you thought let's do it check one two wayne june reporting for duty one two <laughs> one two I started asking him to try and describe what he does. Right. Well, I guess uh, there's a, a million in, in the voice business, there's a million different uh, categories and niches you can fit into. And uh, I guess what I have uh, sort of narrowed myself down to uh, over the years is uh, a voice actor and a narrator. Mm -hmm. And there, there, are, there are different... Uh, different places um you know there's there's uh commercial voiceover guys people who do uh corporate work there's people who do you know things like uh, voicemails there's mm -hmm. people who do you know hosting for live events that sort of thing and you know it all f falls under the rubric of uh of voiceover or voice work but uh with audiobooks and uh just uh within the past couple of years of uh, uh, gaming work mm -hmm. Uh, primarily with uh, Red Hook from Canada. Uh, that's where I get the voice acting from. So I'm an actor. I'm a, <laughs> with a capital A. a an actor. Yes, a voice an actor. Thespian, thespian. There you go. I like that. <laughs> so he does, He's, he was a, he does audiobooks? That's how he got into it, yeah. Um, I'm going to ask him about that in a minute, but he... Yeah, that was actually what he did originally. So it was well before in games he was he was voice acting for audiobooks. He seems to be like he doesn't he he's, sort of, he's talking about voice acting for games and in particular Red Hook, which is obviously the darkest dungeon developers. Mm -hmm. He almost seems to just be like this at least from what I'm getting, this sort of venerable voice actor who's been around for decades and is just he's done one game. 
<laughs> that is what it feels like. And I, so, and that was my natural assumption too. So I asked him, given that he's done one get, like that's the that's the um, impression I got too. So I asked him how he got into it and sort of how how like this dude who did audiobooks kind of got hooked up with this Canadian game studio making this esoteric um, turn-based Lovecraftian uh, combat game. So I was I was interested to find out how the hell they connected in the first place. Yeah. Um, well, when I, uh, when I first started doing uh, voice work, I was trying to find out, you know, find my place in it. Uh, I did all sorts of uh, seminars and um, uh, went to conferences and took uh, acting lessons and took specific voiceover lessons. And uh, uh, basically, I was like, in, in terms of the the industry, I was like a clean slate. You know, mm -hmm. I had done nothing yet, so I wanted to. I didn't have the wisdom at the time to want to actually find out what my strengths were. I just wanted to do everything. You know, <laughs> yeah, so, find out um, what you could have. Yeah, <laughs> and um, I did get one uh, bit of advice. The uh, the fellow I was studying with was, you know, I said, "Well, you know, what's your background? Where you're coming from? What do you like to do?" What are your interests in uh, uh, the you know subject of um, of horror movies and horror literature came up and and he's like well, you ought to you know see if you can work that into sort of an outline of, of what you do and uh, what I ended up doing with that advice is um, recording some Edgar Allan Poe and um, and H P Lovecraft uh, audiobooks, dude. So this guy's actually done. <laughs> yeah, he has. Poe and Lovecraft. You, I'll play you a bit of. Oh um, my him, lord! <laughs> him doing the Raven. Um. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. "'Only this, and nothing more. "'Now distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December, "'and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor.'" Oh my god! Right? It's, <laughs> it's like he's made for it. It is so good! Yeah. Oh my lord! I'm gonna to listen to so, that later. <laughs> I was gonna say, sit on sit on your balcony and have a Ooh. scotch and listen to that. Yeah. yeah, boy. So yeah, he's um his background is definitely that gothic literature, um that new wave, um gothic literature and and it I think it's a natural dovetail into what Red Hook was doing. And um to sort of skip ahead a little bit, uh, an email from a young guy in Canada who said. Uh, he uh, really likes the Lovecraft stuff. He's been into Lovecraft for a long time. He liked what I did with it. He liked my delivery. And he likes to put it on while he's working. And he, he was an artist. And <laughs> cool. that, was, that was Chris Barassa. Mm -hmm. And he's the, um, one of the main guys of Red Hook Studios. He's the artist and the writer and the developer for Darkest Dungeon. However, at this time, this was years and years and years ago, um, so, you know, I just responded to the email. And went, well, thanks a lot. I really appreciate, uh, you know, you're reaching out to give me a compliment. Uh, you know, can't mm. give me too many of those. I love that. <laughs> yeah. You know, all, all that stuff. And then, uh, years later, I get, uh, another email from the same Chris Barassa. Uh, only this time he's got, uh, Red Hook Studios, uh, independent game developing studio, mm -hmm. and they're working on Darkest Dungeon. He started giving me an overview of it and wanted to know if I would uh, be interested in being involved in it. He first wanted me to um, just do a narration for their, uh, uh, what the heck's the name of that place? It's a, a crowdfunding thing. Uh, the Kick Kickstarter project. Kickstarter, the Kickstarter. Yeah. exactly. Yeah, he wanted me to do the narration for uh, his the Kickstarter <laughs> that video would become promotion the opening, yeah. for you know, raising no funds way. to uh, move forward with uh, the concept and move forward with the game. So I said, sure. And then uh, we did that. And mm -hmm. a bit later, um, he called me back and say, said that uh, he and his partner, Tyler Sigmund, um, 
really liked what uh, what I did with the narration and what I'd be interested in getting, you know, and being written into the game. So I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let's talk about it. <laughs> so they just, they were, so they he was just, in. he was just there for the Kickstarter and then they were like, shit, <laughs> we, yeah. we have something here. We can't, we cannot just let this go. Absolutely not. Because you've, I don't know if you've seen that original Kickstarter video, but is it, it is it just the up. opening? Yeah, it's just the opening. But like it, I saw that and I bought the game from that. Like right. I was sold. Um, I mean, so it, yeah, they lightning in a bottle. To be honest, yeah, I like the the game just would not be the same without the narration. Like it's it's such a huge part of just like the whole aesthetic. Like he's he's such an integral part of the of the whole experience, and it's crazy that they would just kind of have him as the Kickstarter. They just like, he was oh just the dude God. that they got because he was free. Yeah, it's crazy. Crazy, right? And uh, it became uh, it became a big part of it, and uh, most of that's due to uh, uh, Tyler and Chris's genius <laughs> as far as developing the most humble dude the, in the world. The whole he is a concept, bit. <laughs> the whole game, the art, and and just the way it works it's, you know, I don't know it's amazing yeah. they uh, wa- wanted to achieve a Lovecraft style ambiance and so he remembered me from the Lovecraft audiobooks and that's how you know he got a hold of me mm-hmm. but uh, I think they I think they just did a great job it's really really been my ple- pleasure and privilege to to work with these guys Much so, too humble. <laughs> so then what happened next is that I I messaged you the morning before or i think maybe the night before and i was like hey ben is there anything you want me to ask wayne june like is there anything that you want me to yeah to put forward to him to find out and the one thing that you said is i i wondered if like whose idea his character was from the perspective of like did they write a bunch of lines to give him and say hey here's you know, here's what you we want you to say. You've got the voice. We just want you to say the lines. Or was it mm-hmm. more of a case of they brought him on and he just created this character for them and just put all of this character that they didn't expect and then suddenly it's just this big thing that they've gone, ah, oh, okay, we have a lot more than we expected. I have a feeling... <laughs> I think I know what the answer to that question is. Yeah. I asked him <laughs> that uh, and he gave me this response. Uh, well, in terms of the uh, the words, the words of the script, I always keep my own counsel, and I don't offer any suggestions unless I'm asked, uh, because they've done their work already. Whoever wrote the script ha- has uh, birthed this already. You know, that's their baby. So, uh, you know, I'm not I'm not going to come in and you know, well, with uh, you know my colossal ignorance here's what i have to say about your business you know so they've written it and it's my job to interpret it and to interpret it um in the way that they direct me and the way that they tell me to so this is a really interesting part of the interview because he basically unprompted gives me this really clear idea of his workflow yeah um which i don't think anyone really thinks about with voice acting no it's kind of people because it's talking is a thing you do every day people just kind of go well oh, it's you just talk right? right you get a microphone you say words you just say it. words yeah it's not the case at all no <laughs> not at all and uh what, what i generally do is uh i work uh, from a home studio remotely so i can either do uh a live session where they're listening in and they can listen to what I do and go, no, not like that, like this. Or, uh, yeah, that was great. Just, you know, do, you know, make it a little angrier or make it a little, make it a little sweeter, you know, whatever, whatever they want to do, they can direct me there. Uh, but what I generally do is take written direction and go from there and I'll, you know, submit a file, a short one, a couple of minutes worth with like three or four different, um, attitudes three or four different takes of the same lines and then they can take it on their end from there and go uh okay number two sucks uh number one number one was okay but number three was good you know and then we settled on that and then from then on it's just a back and forth of trying to trying to fulfill 
uh, what they want me to do from what I've learned uh, going into it so far. And, and that's basically how it is. If someone were to, to, were to ask me or if there's some kind of uh, if there's an obvious error, uh, you know, grammatically or something like that, you know, I'll, I'll tip them to it and uh, and let them know. But uh, that's basically it. You know. So then I kind of moved on a little bit and I, I sort of, at this point, he was giving me a pretty deep insight into his workflow and his kind of process. So I jumped the gun a bit um, and I asked him about the hardest part of his job, which I realized in retrospect, I kind of, we've been talking for about 10 minutes and we didn't know each other, but I felt <laughs> like he was ready to open up. And I, So what you're gonna see is me getting a little too eager uh, and then him trying to be very polite about it. <laughs> so I apologize in advance. I don't know, the fact that you got to wear all the hats. In my particular case, I'm a one-man operation, so I have to uh, seek work. I have to do the marketing. I have to do the uh, recording. I have to do the editing. I have to do the mastering. I have to, you know, run the business. Uh, I have to do the books. I've got to decide on what kind of uh, budget there is for advertising at any given time, if there is. So that was something I didn't really realize, is that before he's exporting and sending all these files um, to Red Hook or to like the audiobook companies, he's actually sitting down and he's going through and he's, he's clipping out just the narration that they need. Like, he's not sending them the raws. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. I would have... I mean, obviously, to a certain degree, you would do that just to clean up your work but yeah it seems it seems odd or at least yeah i wouldn't expect you know if if someone was like oh i want voice work from you i would just send them the rawest and most uncut stuff they wanted i guess when you're when there's you're trying to sell yourself when you're actually trying out you know this is your job you're actually trying to get work you have to you know it, it, this could be the the thing that sets you apart from the people who do just send raw audio <laughs> directly to their to right. whoever's if, commissioning it. Yeah, if you open up the the zip file and it's got ten really polished, you know, MP3s versus you know an hour of audio that you then have to spend, you know, two interns days editing. Like it yeah. makes a huge difference. Yeah, I, I was uh, when I first started out doing an audio book. Um, they're notoriously. Uh, 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 work heavy in terms of uh, to get one hour of finished audio down uh, with preparation, with performance, mm -hmm. with editing, uh, with uh, the mastering, um, working out the artwork for the cover if I'm responsible for that, which I am with my own stuff. Uh, you know, you can, I was getting like 12, 15 hours of work to finish one hour of one hour. finished or edited audio ready yep. for real retail mm -hmm. and that was just that was just too much um i've gotten it down now um to about six to one seven to one mm -hmm. so you know it's uh one of the challenges is um having people who uh approach you to um to uh cast you for an audiobook for example mm -hmm. they they don't necessarily understand that uh, you know, there's like, uh, I got, I've got got uh, X amount of words. It should come out to about uh, two hours, you know. Right. And they think that's all the that's, time it takes. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not recording an answering machine message for a phone. You know, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it takes a lot more than that. So uh, mm -hmm. that's another challenge too, getting people to understand, uh, those who don't know, getting people to understand what, uh, what's, what's involved in it, what, uh, what, actual, what actual kind of man hours you're putting into something. Does he do answering machine messages? He, I can ask for you, do you know? <laughs> no! <laughs> no, I feel like that's way overstepping, but like, does he? I probably, yeah. Oh man, that would be the best answering machine It'd message. It'd be so good. Oh my but lord. But it's, it is interesting that like, I think, he's so right though, people just don't, they don't, like, I think with yeah, creative stuff anyway. Like, they don't it's it. even with like writing. If someone's like, they see a book and it's like, uh, like how many words in the book? Uh, ten thousand, hundred thousand, and you know they go, oh, that's just ten thousand, hundred thousand, fifty thousand words. You're like, right. yeah, no. not really. It's it's the best 
10,000, 50,000, 100,000 of about 10 times that. Exactly. Um, and you poured over every word yeah. 50 to 100 times. Like, yeah, definitely. And he seems to have this, he, I mean, we both seem to have this, and it's, it's part of why we clicked so quickly. We both just have this, this reticence toward people who pay for these services and don't really understand what it is they're actually paying for. Right, um, yeah. Which is a complicated thing in the artistic space because you're trying to explain to someone, look, this is a business of creating something from nothing. Like, we're doing this magic trick that you're paying us for. Like, this is, this is effectively, like, real life, you know, prestigitation. Like, <laughs> we're making something from nothing. And you're saying, well, it should only take you this long. Like, no, dude. Like, magic it doesn't have a... There's no clock on it, you know? Right. It's... it's yeah it is work but also like you can't quantify some of that time it's not as one-to-one -one as you know building a house you can measure the time it takes to build a house literally you can't always measure the time it takes to do a creative thing literally and so i kind of asked him about that i was like look how do you feel about the what's what's your temperature on the space how do you feel when you approach clients what's kind of your you know, where do you sit in that space? Because we obviously have a pretty strong stance, I guess. So I kind of, I kind of asked him his opinion on it. Yeah, and uh, I think you hit the key word there in, uh, as, as far as this subject goes, which is creative. Uh, any kind of creative process is like, uh, it's, um, you know, it's a different animal. Um, it's, it's very similar to what, uh, what I'd done before. Uh, I'm going to hit you with a bombshell here before he gets to it. Um, he's about to reveal that he has this whole B career that you didn't know about. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> so just prepare yourself for that. All right. Uh, when I was 15, uh, I joined a band and uh, just never looked back. Uh, I've, been, I've been playing drums and singing. What? And, uh, right? In bands for, oh, God. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm going to spend 50 days. years now. It does. So. Yep. So um, that was one of my um, motivations, actually, for uh, developing voice work. This mm -hmm. is that's something I could do uh, without leaving the house. Yep. <laughs> without without yep. Get, without getting out of my throat. Mm -hmm. uh, He's wearing a bottle. But a lot of the problems <laughs> in terms of being, you know, creative. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you'd be surprised, or maybe you wouldn't, because it's just it's it's common knowledge. Uh, you know, people. Uh, want music for free you know mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. uh i saw a cartoon the other day where uh one guy is given uh this kid who's getting into uh music for a living he's giving him advice and he's going you know there's there's no there's no future in this kind of business you know you really ought to do something else you know you ought to go to school or you ought to get another different kind of a job get some vocational training or something like that and the kid mm -hmm. you know looks puzzled in the cartoon and then in the next frame he goes but I'm having a birthday party. Can you play for free? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's exactly well, it. That, that's why it's so hard. Mm -hmm. so. Given that he mentioned this 50 years of being creative, I kind of thought about the amount of experience that he would have gained over that time. Because, like, we've been doing this for nearly... I've been doing this... F I've been making content on the internet for nearly nine years now, um, which is crazy to think about. But he's been um, he's been doing this sort of pretty much his whole life. So I wanted to know what it was and what were the projects that, that didn't work? What were the things that, that for him were like his biggest kind of failures that he learned from? That's what, that's one lesson too, is uh, a big part of, uh, of any endeavor is uh, uh, creative, uh, especially, or at least from my perspective, but, uh, but anything really is, uh, you know, l learning the demands of the market, uh, you can come to something with a lot of passion and be just like, oh, I want to be this, I want to be this. But if, you, if you're creating something that there's no market for, you know, you, it's time to go back to the drawing board, you know. Mm. And do you find that, have you found in your career that there have been projects that you've started pursuing where that's that sort of ended up being the case? And you've oh, kind yeah. of, when, uh, when yeah. Was, uh, you know, so <laughs> doing an, a, 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 an exclusive uh, deep cuts only from... Uh, atomic rooster albums uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know, that's that you know not everybody shares that uh, or not a lot of people share that musical taste mm -hmm. um, especially back in those days I mean pre-internet um, pretty much nowadays you can <clears throat> get online 
and you know find find a community uh, that's grown up around uh, almost any interest really but uh, you know back then it uh, <laughs> if it was an obscure band uh, it was an obscure band and that was it mm. you know so modeling yourself after that being a cover band doing those kind of things that <laughs> Not a good choice. <laughs> not, not your best I fig- decision. I figured, I figured it's got to be. It's got to fill a hole in the market because nobody's doing it. You know. Uh, <laughs> but maybe there's a reason no one's doing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, which is a tricky yeah, thing to good. realize. That's so funny. I mean, everyone starts there, I guess. You know, you got to start copying other people. Yeah, but um, it's it's like it's so true how like nowadays you can if there's like a weird obscure thing that exists like you can you can find the people that are into it exactly it didn't used to exist yeah like there's there's so many examples of that nowadays you know stuff like the probably the biggest one on top of my head is like the the classic tetris world championships which is just like this m- super grassroots movement of people competitively playing nes tetris like the og tetris from like the 80s or something and it's like these group of people who like all grew up playing the game like separately and then 20 years later 30 years later they've all just realized oh there's actually a bunch of people who are into playing this game let's host tournaments (laughs) and now it's like because of the internet and because of streaming because of you know reddit and twitch and things like that it's just there's this massive community around people playing like a 30 year old game i guess that's what he's alluding to is that like that he came up in that space but that stuff didn't exist. Like, you were just the weirdo that was still doing it. Yeah, you know, he didn't have the, what, the Atomic Rooster fan There was Reddit. no subreddit, yeah. There was no subreddit for Atomic Rooster. There probably is now, and there's probably a few thousand people on it. But, but... I, I think that's a hard thing for people that are younger than us to understand, is, like, that that, that, that didn't use... That wasn't an option. Like, you couldn't... You also just couldn't, like, look stuff up. Like, yeah, I couldn't tell so you about a band, and you, you couldn't just like find their stuff no you had to physically find their cd yeah you had to hand me a cd and say hey listen to track five like it, <laughs> it's a different kind of universe that we live in yeah um and so given that i was also interested in in like the good stuff so like what what was like the biggest surprise for him or what was like the kind of the this the stuff that was successful that that kind of that he wasn't expecting because i think it's obvious that in hindsight the cover band stuff not the best option um but i was like well what did what was the stuff that has worked that you didn't think would um and he had a pretty surprising answer i think yeah well, yeah it was it was kind of a uh at least the voice stuff it was it was a matter of i was, I was a little bit more business savvy by that point uh i didn't start uh doing this and until i don't know uh 20 years ago so you know i was in my 40s uh, so I, I, I had an, uh, more of an idea of what a business does and what it's all about. So, you know, learning the demands of the market and balancing that with um, what are my strengths and uh, where do the twain meet? You know, where, how can I put this together? And it took a while to learn that. You know, um, I ended up doing mostly I do mostly um, horror stuff or, you know, dark type material and uh, my wife says it's because I'm just an, a natural creep, so I can I, I can be creepy without much effort. So early on, I did some uh, uh, I did some stuff. There's a market for it. I don't think it was particularly good casting. I had the voice, but uh, it wasn't something I was passionate about. It was like self help uh, self help books, you know how how to how to deal with anger, um, how to lose weight. Uh, you know, if uh, when I was doing it, as if if people had known who was giving them all this advice about anger management, I think it would have been ironic to say the least. <laughs> yeah, they would have uh, probably put down the audiobook. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I think we need a self help book about how to reduce anger, but from the narrator of Darkest Dungeon. Just is a very aggressive dude. Yeah, yes. And- talking about the the depths of the human character <laughs> and where where the anger festers <laughs> where it lives and where yeah. it grows malignant over time <laughs> definitely yeah, let's get them kicks let's get that get a kickstarter going <laughs> <laughs> get a kickstarter happening i think, I think we know where this is going absolutely 
Um, but I decided to make, I decided to kind of change gears a bit. Um, and one of the, one of the things he's alluding to here is that he found his niche pretty quickly. Um, or pretty slowly, depending on how you look at it. But the minute he got into games, he kind of, it seemed like he immediately found the space that he'd been hunting for the whole time. And I think like, I don't know about you, but one of the things that I struggled with when we first started making content was like, where do we fit in? Mm, um, yeah. What's what's the space that we occupy that no one else occupies? And we found that now. It's taken, you know, five, six years of this company and, you know, 10 years in total of like making content. Um, so I wanted to know how he kind of found the space he's in because no one else is doing what he's doing. Um, and no one else is doing it the way he's doing it. So I kind of asked, like, how did you find that niche? And, and if you could give advice to other creators, you know, whether they be they be young or old um, or anywhere in between, uh, what would you kind of pass on to people trying to get into any creative business? Um, or what would you recommend? Uh, it, it's worth it. It's worth the effort and it's worth the work. And, you know, you learn something new uh, in the meantime. So, mm. I mean, you know, it's just it's a win win situation. Absolutely. And um, just in terms of finding your niche, I had a pretty good experience starting out. One recommendation I had is uh, there's um, various studios around that produce uh, uh, audio books for the blind. And uh, you can volunteer there. So uh, there's one in a city near me uh, called uh, Reading for the Blind and Dyslexic. Mm -hmm. And you'd go in there and typically for... Um, a two-hour session, but you can do two a day if you want. Uh, and you go in, and you don't know what you're going to get. The, mm -hmm. uh, you might get a newspaper. You might get um, a novel. You might get poetry. You might get a textbook. Uh, uh, okay. You might get, um, I don't know, anything. I mean, it's just, uh, I read uh, um, I read an owner's manual for a microwave oven. <laughs> yeah not 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 usually what you know mm -hmm. uh, i pick up for light reading but yeah, yeah. Uh, and, but there's responsibilities there i mean you've got to um go for it word for word uh, and at the same time if there's something that's unclear or something that you think could be uh, a problem uh to a person who's not sighted to to understand what they're talking about you have to just got to deliver it the right way you know mm -hmm. the right speed with the right intensity and without going overboard you never want to overshadow the material you don't want you don't want them thinking about you you want them absorbing the information mm -hmm. you know so um so that was a good experience because uh i did that for a long while and did everything and and that was one thing that helped me find out where my strengths were mm, trying everything so. I find it really interesting that he he doesn't he like he doesn't want to overshadow the work which is funny because his performance in darkest dungeon like yeah it's you're not really you're not like always just like oh his voice is so amazing like it's it's incredible it's it is like the writing the writing really comes through and it's yeah it's it's not like other kind of games that have sort of you know big name narrators or you know the narrator is like a like a big deal of the game where you kind of you get lost in the narration a little bit I think like I don't know like maybe Stanley Parable like the narrator in Stanley Parable is is such a yeah he's so sarcastic and he's got so much personality to where he is a character whereas his uh the delivery in Darkest Dungeon is a lot more yeah it's 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 actually giving information kind of it's it's reacting to what's happening and it's kind of giving context to like the gr the amazing feats that your characters are performing in in the in this in this dark and and, and dank dungeon. <laughs> A devastating blow. A dizzying blow to body and brain. Their formation is broken. Maintain the offensive. Annihilated. Slowly. Gently. This is how a life is taken. So naturally, I couldn't really resist um, asking about Darkest Dungeon 2. Um, <laughs> so that's what I did. Uh, so that's... I, he didn't give me much, but I had to ask. Yeah. Sure. The uh, Darkest Dungeon 2 is coming out. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I can't talk specifically about uh, yep. 
uh, I try. Uh, details or you dates really or anything try. like that, main, mainly because I don't know most of it. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 it's a need-to-know situation where I find out what I have to find out that's relative to my part of it. And uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's in process, it's going on, and um, it, sh- it should be out soon. That's pretty common for most for most voice actors. They, you know, you, you ask them about, oh, like, what do you know about this? Or like, what, you know, what about this game that you think you're going to be in? And they'll say, I mean, I've recorded some lines, but I have no idea what it was for. Um, that was that was pretty common with uh with with Smash Brothers. There there was sort of it was like murmurs that like some of the voice actors for some certain characters were at Nintendo. And people sort of ask them on Twitter, like obviously they're not gonna say, "Yeah, it was for Smash." I mean, my characters in Smash, they would just say like, "I did some lines," and I don't. They didn't tell me. They didn't tell me what it was for. I just did some lines. Um, yeah. So yeah, voice actors almost never, <laughs> almost never know what's going on. <laughs> right. But I was like, "What if he did though?" <laughs> it was my thinking. What if he Fair knew enough. anything? Was what kind of he, when my. What if he knew out. everything? What if he? What, what if, if he could he's tell making me the game something. himself? What yep. if it's just him? It's not, but yeah. it's not. You can try. You know, it's uh, uh, been an education uh, learning about the gaming industry. I mean, I didn't even know oh, I knew the gaming industry existed, of course, but I didn't know there was such a um, a, a focused community out there. Mm. It's uh, it's uh, it's incredible. A lot a lot of people um, relate to games and the gaming industry uh, and it's not all kids but uh, a lot of uh, young people the it's not all children it's, it's just kids, mostly like, children the people yelling slurs definitely are yeah. um, it's just mostly children mostly ch- i think maybe he got lucky like in that the darkest dungeon attracts a particular type of crowd a particular type of child yeah <laughs> and 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 they seem to relate to that uh, much in the same way that you know when I was 15 when I was 16 17 the way uh, the way I related to music mm. and uh, you know and music was a big part you know of my generation when you're a kid growing up uh, in the uh, late 60s and throughout the 70s it, it was uh, you know music was the thing if, mm. uh, you know if if you weren't interested in music well, what, what, you <laughs> what, what the hell's wrong with you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, it's, uh, it's, yeah. The same. There's there, there's there's a, there's a lot more, um, uh, I don't know, different areas uh, these days, and you know, with uh, with the internet uh, coming along, just changed everything in every industry, and uh, I think that's just a great positive thing. But uh, you know, learning that there's such a huge, uh, great, interested. Uh, Community. It's a focus group, really, on uh, <laughs> yeah uh, on on games. That is really educational. I've, I've I've got a lot of friends through it from you know interacting on social media and you know just uh, uh, getting to know these folks. A lot of streamers. I didn't know anything about streaming before oh, yeah. you know this, this happened. So. <laughs> oh no! He met the streamers. No, <laughs> he did. Can't send them back now. <laughs> So then I just asked, like, if there was anything that he wanted to kind of plug at the end. Um, if there was anything that he was, that he, anything he had upcoming, anything that he wanted people to know about. Yeah, you could uh, search me out on, on uh, YouTube. I tend to use that for um, more or less just uh, sort of to let people know what's, uh, what I have going on at any given point. I'm, besides uh, doing voiceover stuff, I promised myself for years and years and years and now and uh that uh i was going to finally get back to hp lovecraft i did three volumes uh of his stuff a uh, number of years ago and mm-hmm. uh I, I really enjoyed it i really liked it but uh i've been promising promising myself that i'm going to do his whole fiction catalog it's mm-hmm. just you know that's where my personal interest lies and uh, stuff keeps coming up you know i mean be, yeah. be, because of the fact that this would be a self-published venture it's uh, it's more or less on speculation so mm-hmm. if a, a job comes along you know guess what, what gets put on the back shelf yeah so, always the way uh, <clears throat> that's been happening and happening and happening so finally i'm like you know uh, i put my foot down 
and uh, said uh, 2020 is going to be the year. Um, I started working on a website, and uh, whew, that's, that's another challenge. I yeah. started programming w websites in like 1999, 2000, uh, way back with like HTML1. <laughs> so nothing he learned was right. Yeah. No, exactly. Like, but we veer into like HTML5 territory for a second. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like us talking about like uh, how quickly markup languages changed. Yeah, we're just some two big nerds. More than five or six that, now, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and well, it's it's a whole different universe now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's incredible. So I'm trying to trying to get up to speed on programming and accomplishing what uh, I want to accomplish, but I want to do it. I want to learn how to do it because yeah. when it comes up to making a change. Uh, I don't want to have to have somebody in the payroll that knows how to do it. And you know, because, you know, it's a speculative venture and, uh, you know, it, I'd rather have money coming in this direction, you know? So, <laughs> Correct. You know. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. So, uh, Look, if there's any if there's any style of programming that is most like HP Lovecraft, it's absolutely web development. That place absolutely. is just it's just pain. It's just pure pain and like like have we gone too far? No, let's keep going. <laughs> Working on a website and it's going to be called uh, Weird Audiobooks. Mm -hmm. uh, weirdaudiobooks.com. Love it. And uh, at uh, what I do with YouTube is. Um, a lot of the stuff that's eventually going to be going up for retail download uh, on weird audiobooks appears um, on uh, on YouTube, cool. either pure audio with just a picture, or I've also started um, uh, creating videos to go along with some of the uh, uh, some of the samples and some of the teasers, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's another thing, you know. So <laughs> <I'm>, uh, <laughs> always learn, learn, always learn learning. Yeah, learning to do something else and getting distracted that way. So, uh, but it's just it's, <laughs> it's, it's nothing stuff. but great fun. Nothing yeah. but great fun. And, That's good. Uh, so, I have a um, SoundCloud account that I put mm -hmm. stuff on. That's uh, uh, some of the same stuff, some different stuff from audiobook things. Uh, but I also put music up there because cool. uh, I've I've stopped uh, touring. I'm off the road, uh, but I still have a full-blown studio i got my drums here i got keyboards guitars and everything in the universe and uh i do a lot of uh, uh music stuff mostly covers but some of my own stuff i uh, play everything sing everything mm -hmm. produce it Excellent. start from scratch and see yeah. what i end up with and that's that's a lot of fun so my music ends up there too that's okay. on soundcloud and i'm on twitter and i'm on facebook and the, i'm on instagram everywhere, yeah, everywhere you expect yeah. excellent well I'll, I'll make sure to link all of that um, when when this video does eventually go up, yeah, um, yeah, it's, be great. it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, Wayne. I appreciate you taking the time. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, like uh, you know, my wife said, I'm creepy, so I love attention. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> he's so humble. He I'm is. trying to be nice, and he's just like still being humble. There is a lot more to this man than I thought there was. Right. I mean, that was he, my thoughts. I mean, absolutely, he fits the bill of doing Lovecraft um, audiobooks, which is just so exciting. I did not realize that was a thing I could have. It's the, the kind of thing world, where it's yeah. like, yeah, you know, you, you play Darkest Dungeon, you're like, dude, this is so Lovecraft. You're like, oh, wouldn't it be sick if, there was, if he read Lovecraft? It's like, he's doing it. <laughs> he, he's doing he, it now. He, he very much knows what he's about, and I, I, I feel like he's, you know, if, if you're like... You know, if you're like a fan of Lovecraft, like you're probably going to enjoy Darkest Dungeon, which means you probably like this dude's narration, which means you probably like his stuff. Like yeah. he talked about finding the niche, and like, dear God, if he hasn't found the niche, like he's exactly. he's he's absolutely nailed that that like it's not not even just a niche, but that association. Like he he's got that. But it's like he's found an aesthetic almost, or it's, or like a brand, but it, but it's not. That's it's, why I always I always hate using the word brand because it feels kind of dirty. Like it's he's found like his his vibe or his aesthetic or his kind of tone, I guess. Yeah, Do you know what I mean. It, like it's not the same thing. And and especially you know having having stuff like Lovecraft, which is public domain, it it kind of you know it, it's it's something that everyone can get into 
because it is so like it's like universal like it's like it's like Sherlock you know there's so many renditions yeah. of Sherlock that you can be a fan of Sherlock and find other people Sherlock as in the character not the, the BBC TV show um, <laughs> yeah. but you can, you can be a fan of Sherlock as a character and find this group of people who are also interested in that kind of Victorian era detective story mm-hmm. thing and kind of the same with Lovecraft where it's like you know you, it, it, it opens the gates to this to the, to the other side uh, but it kind of opens the gates to this kind of part this, this subculture of like horror and just you know gothic aesthetics and things like definitely. that definitely yeah it's, it's it's your gateway to like your your bloodborne and you know the, the the weird part of the internet that you know it's maybe not it's not as in fat anymore i guess yeah but it, but but it's always it's always cool it's always it's always interesting like you're never it's never out of fashion but it's never in fashion that's kind of the best bit is it's on yeah. the fringe the whole time yeah i like it I wanted to end with um, this delightful video that Wayne made where um, he... I'm just going to play it. I'm not going to explain it. Sure. Um, what is it? This is an Amazon we'll Echo ad. It is. I've is seen the me? ads. I've seen memes based it's on It's called this. Amazon Echo. How's it going? Uh, I'm just finishing up right now. Is it on? Oh, it's always on. Can it hear me right now? Uh, nope. It only hears you when you use the wake word we chose. Alexa. Well, what does it do? Alexa, what do you do? In time, you will know <laughs> the tragic extent of my failings. Awesome. Huh. Alexa, play rock music. Because I flow. Let Jiggy draw a Alexa, what time is it? In truth, I cannot tell how much time has passed since I sent that letter. <laughs> oh my god. That's so good. Did... So I can just hear you anywhere? Yes. Well, everyone can hear you anyway. Oh. These are that custom that lines here. I was thinking of putting it there, but it works anywhere. Oh my lord. Special thanks to everyone involved. Wayne June for taking the time. Ben Hill, my co host. That Adley, Adam Bradley, for all of his support and advice. And of course, our top Patreons, Yoop Kumans and Cameron. We couldn't do this without you. Thanks for watching and listening. If you're interested in this, check out our podcast on The Darkest Dungeon. Thanks again, guys. We'll catch you next time.